welcome back guys to the JPS podcast and we have Lyle McDonald back on the show and we build on our discussion from the prior episode, episode 77, where we talked about the primary driver of muscle growth and we discuss in this episode the concept of effective reps, which has been gaining a lot of popularity in the evidence-based field. And for those of you who are not familiar with this concept, I highly recommend you check out uh, Bertage Fajerli and Chris Beardley's, as well as James Krieger's uh, discussion and work surrounding uh, the concept of hypertrophic, effective, or stimulating reps. And basically, what they're investigating is how many reps within a set are leading to a potent growth stimulus. And some cliff notes for you here, as we get closer to uh, muscular failure and we take a set closer failure, the final few reps are having a more potent effect on stimulating muscle growth in comparison to the earlier sets in a rep, uh, in a set, sorry. So that is essentially what we're talking about in this episode, as well as how the stimulus changes uh, as we advance in our lifting career and some uh, very, very interesting uh, discussion around progression uh, for different training ages and levels of advancement in this episode. So I hope you guys enjoy. And as always, uh, Lyle is very informative. He's got some really good uh, and somewhat contrarian ideas as to how we should progress the stimulus for hypertrophy, especially in uh, advanced lifters, how we should set up their training because it does get a little bit more nuanced and I like the way Lyle thinks about uh, most things in fitness and uh, this was no exception. So without further ado, Lyle McDonald. Yeah, no, for sure. Um, but yeah, let's uh, discuss this effective reps concept. Mm-hmm. So do you want to outline, I guess, uh, the origins, history of yeah. this concept? Because a lot of people are talking about it, um, but I feel not many actually fully understand what it is and what it's trying yeah. to do. I think they view it as like an on or off switch where it's like, well, right. the, the first few reps of a set do nothing. And then boom, all of a sudden, like sure. you're just getting these effective reps um, when that's probably not the case. Uh, yeah. So yeah, over to you, Long. Yeah, I, you know what? Historically, I almost want to say that um, Blade, Borge Fe- Fagerly, you know, I've actually never Fagerly. known how to pronounce his name. Fagerly. Thank you. Um, th- I, think, I, I think Blade was probably one of the first ones that was talking about it, and he was involved with a researcher, I want to say Matthias. Um, and I mean, this was, God, he, it was funny, actually, my old, old form, right? This is like early 2000s. Uh, he, Martin Burke, and Alan Aragon were all on there before anyone had ever heard of them. Like, I, I saw them kind of develop some of their ideas very, very early on. And I think Blade was really the first one talking about it. You know, that's where his Maya reps ideas came from in the sense of, you know, basically just a rest-pause method, essentially. You did an activation set. The idea being, like what we tied into in part one, kind of getting full activation of all the muscle fibers, right? Now, if you just stop there and you wait a couple minutes and you do another straight set, some of the fibers will recover, right? You kind of have to go through however many, you know, let's call them ineffective reps. I think that's poor terminology, but to just to distinguish them, to get to that, that full activation again. His idea was get full activation, Rest 15 seconds, do three or four more reps, or however many you can get. Rest 15 more seconds, do two or three more. Rest 15, do two or three more. You know, dog trap training, very similar. I think the big difference is being, you know, dog trap goes to, sorry, dog crap, Dante Trudell, uh, his brainchild, goes to concentric failure on the activation set. I don't know that Blade was. I don't know what he's currently I promoting. Think I think it's like to an RP eight nine yeah so it's close like i seem to recall him years ago writing about going like till the to like the, the first bar speed slow down like and that's probably you know that two to three reps in reserve range like that's when it's starting it so i think and he was i suspect we know when folks go to total failure frequently they're just things get fried right and the number of reps they can do subsequently drops enormously if I had to guess and put words into his mouth, I think Blade was trying to avoid that kind of real super fatigue on the first set 
to probably get more cumulative reps, right? Like, I don't know if you've done my reps or dog crap. I've played around with both. And, and I've found some, like, there's some really distinct patterns for me. If I get eight reps on my first set to concentric failure, I will go eight, three, two, one. Like, it just doesn't matter what the exercise is. Whereas if I get to, like, 12 or 15 to failure, it'll be, like, 12, 5, 5, 4, 3. Like, it takes forever to get the set done mm -hmm. just because I think there's not quite so much. So I, I think that was Blade's idea. So I'd say he was really the first one to, to really write about it enormously. Dog crap's ideas. I mean, rest pause had pause been around forever. Like, make no mistake. I would almost argue that the old 20 rep squat was probably, you know, mm. along those lines, right? You did the first eight or 10 reps pretty continuously, and then you just ground it out or, or died trying. Um, but I think, so I think he was really the one that, that first wrote about it, and Dante Trudell. In recent years, I'd probably say Chris Beardsley, um, who runs, I think it's the Strength and Conditioning page. Uh, he's probably written about it, I think, the most extensively. Um, and he's got a little ebook I keep meaning to read that basically, you know, muscular tension is the, the key to growth. We need to go get the little Kindle book one of these days. Um, and I don't know if there are people intermediate that were sort of writing about it. We might be talking uh, Krie about Krieger also uh, okay. built upon uh, Chris's idea of effective reps, but James, uh, I think, did a better job at sort of I explaining that it's not effective or ineffective. He just spoke about like. Sure strongly hypertrophic reps versus weekly hypertrophic reps. And he yeah. um, has a formula that sort of, uh, you know, looks at for every sort of repetition um, range to failure, um, you know, an approximation of how many strongly hypertrophic reps, uh, sure. you know, within that. So there's been uh, some discussion there as well. Yeah. And I think, you know, I, I think I sort of got into that in, in in sort of part one of my article, it's like, okay, you know, because we know that there's multiple ways to get to full activation. You can do heavy loads for relatively low repetitions. You can do relatively lighter loads as long as you get near or to failure, you know, at some point. And it depends on the range. There's that one leg press study. The last 18 reps of an 18 rep set was at full activation. At 15 RM, it was like the last three to five reps. So, um, so yes, yeah, so I, I see where James is certainly going with that. You know, it's, mm. it's not an on off switch. It's not like, oh, if you just do eight reps, two reps short, that the, the set is wasted, mm -hmm. right? You may get less total hypertrophic reps or effective reps in that set. But then there's also the counter effect. You may get more total volume in the workout, mm. right? And I think th and this was, I, I look back at that little series I wrote and that was a point that I meant to touch on and didn't, right? So I just kind of law, I just sort of, right? So it's like, okay, we know that 85% of max, you get four recruitment. That's about five to eight reps in that range, right? At triples, you don't get any more recruitment, but you probably get a lot less total volume unless you do just a million sets, mm -hmm. right? To do that seven by three or 10 by three versus four by eight, it takes four times as long, it's exhausting, your joints fall off. So if we're looking for, you know, because we're not just looking at, well, the question we don't know is how many reps are optimal per set, per workout, you know, can you get, is it just a matter of cumulative across the workout, does it has to be per set? And I think this is where some of the disagreement, you know, Chris Beardsley has written, uh, and I address this in my most recent article, this idea that it's the last five reps of the set to failure that are, and man, people on my forum tried to explain this to me for weeks and posted what he wrote, and I can't follow his logic or his argument, and I don't agree, I don't think I agree with him. I don't think you can put it in an absolute number sense that it is those last five reps to failure that are the, because I think it depends on the loading and it depends on the number of factors. And I don't know that he's necessarily saying you must go to failure to get growth. Mm -hmm. And I don't want that idea to come out of this discussion, right? This whole thing is not saying you got to go to like, that's the old HIT mislogic. Clearly like, all right, hypothetical. Let's say you need to get 10 effective reps per workout. That's optimal. This is a made up number. You could do two sets to grinding failure and maybe you get those last five and you get 10 effective reps in two sets. Or you could do five sets where you only get two effective reps per set, right? We're assuming that they don't have to be subsequent or assuming it's total work, whatever it is. Those should be functionally equivalent, right? Now we might ask then, 
well, why bother? Why do five sets of two effective reps when you can just do two sets of five and get the hell out of the gym? Well, not all exercises lend themselves to failure. Um, honestly, not everyone is good at pushing mm -hmm. to failure. Um, there might be other reasons to, to you know, to, to, to pick the, the four to five straight sets at two RIR versus mm. two completely gr grinding sets after failure eventually just burns people out. They just flat out get exhausted. Um, I know how much of a fan you are of uh, infographics on uh, Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I recently yeah. um, made a graphic sort of uh, looking at this exact topic um, because I, I did notice that you uh, didn't really discuss it in your, in your article. And that was how if you have higher, so basically it was a, a graph on the X axis, you had volume in terms of number of sets increasing, right. say 1, 10, 20, 30, 40. And then yeah. on the um, Y axis, you had average uh, intensity. So proximity to failure. Yeah. And basically I, I, you know, plotted that if you have one to 10 sets, your average intensity is got to be much higher. And as yes. you increase sets, you know, it's a pretty much a linear decrease in average intensity, generally yeah. staying uh, above, you know, an RPE of five, right? For the most part, like, you know, if you go yeah. below that, it's, it's really just fucking pissing, you know, your time up against yeah. the wall. Oh yeah. Um, now you're doing just warm up sets. Exactly. Correct. Yeah. correct. So, so I, I explain this and I think that's where people don't understand the, the vault, the relationship between volume and intensity, which, which you did discuss um, yeah. in your most recent article. And I think the fact that they are inextricably related is something that needs to be drilled home. It's like you can train to failure. Sure. You can uh, go harder in, terms of your relative intensity but that will come at the cost of potentially needing to do less volume and if you want to do more volume it's like well sure. your average relative intensity generally has to come down so do you want to discuss yes. uh, the relationship between uh intensity and volume and why that's a, a big part of this uh discussion in terms of effective I, reps i mean i think you basically just sort of summed it up right and i i suspect if you start to look at you know quote unquote all the you know effective programs right across this this myriad scheme what you're probably seeing is exactly that relationship, right? So Art, Art Jones, his bullet to number one, you did like three sets to true failure, three times is about nine sets a week. Now he was saying, ah, this was a response to the 20 set per workout, you know, bullshit as he liked to think of it, of, you know, what Arnold and Frank and when those guys were doing. Go find some video of Arnold war uh, training, those guys training. They trained hard, make no mistake. They trained heavily, make no mistake you will not see a lot of sets taken to true failure. You'll see them. I mean, again, they're, they're working and it may very well kind of work out. It's like, okay, they did 20 sets per workout of which multiple were warmups. People forget this too, right? They would go 15, 12, 10, eight. The first couple were kind of pissing in the wind warmups. There were a couple of heavy sets and across four or five exercises, they, they probably got similar numbers of effective reps of guys grinding it out, you know, in the Art Jones compound as they watched out for alligators. Um, so yeah, like, you know, I think if you even look at, like, you know, like I said, all, all the common systems that sort of have been shown to work, whether it's like, you know, I think Pollock one was like, ah, eight sets every five days and they weren't usually to limit. So then you look at like dog crap, right? It's typically one or two rest pause sets to, you know, per muscle group to true failure. You guess a true failure, rest 15 seconds, two or three reps, one or two reps done. He does a loaded eccentric. He calls it loaded stretching. I still think it's just a weighted eccentric personally, neither here nor there. Right. So he's doing however many limit sets, you know, two limit sets, two rest pause sets every five days, or you might prefer to do eight or 10 fairly hard sets twice a week. And I bet if you were able to sort of math it out or estimate it out, I bet the estimated, I bet the, the number of, you know, truly effective reps, or I forget what term you said uh, James uses, they're probably pretty damn similar, big picture. Mm. Um, it's just we're sort of, you know, Dante's idea was he wanted to get the greatest stimulus in the lowest volume of training possible. His premise being that volume is what caught, you know, more volume just causes more fatigue. Get the biggest muscular stimulus, move the hell on with your life and try to get out of the gym as quick. That's not for everyone. And dog crap burns a lot of people out. That constant going to limits, even in his system, you know, you don't RDL to failure. They do some Widowmaker 20 rep squats, but there's certain movements that you don't go to failure because trust me, trying to take RDLs to failure or deadlifts to failure, if you're doing them, bad, bad idea. <laughs> 
Yeah. Uh, I've done 20 rep deadlifts once. Ooh. It, Stuart Mc, random tangent. Stuart McRobert wrote about these years ago in Hard Ganner. He did a set. What he left out was that he was injured for six months. That got left out of the article. But I was a maniac when I was younger. I wanted to do them, and I'm built pretty well for deadlifts. Like I could do sets of eight and not break form. And rest pausing deadlifts, not a good idea. I did it one time to say I've done it. I would never do it again. I would never recommend it. I would never take deadlifts anywhere that close to failure for most people. Mm -hmm. So we do have kind of these competing, competing issues, but I think it sounds like your infographic basically nailed it. If you want to do eight to 10 sets per muscle group, you should probably stay two to three reps in reserve. Maybe, you know, in my, my general training program, if you're going to do four sets of an exercise, probably start at three to four reps in reserve. And as fatigue accumulates, you'll probably hit, two to three, one to two, that four set might be failure. That works, then you switch exercises. Um, or if you want to do, you know, two sets of rest pause or three sets to total limits, probably works out about the same in the big picture. But what you can't do is both, right? And this is where the muscle magazines miss, because all those guys are, I do high volume and high intensity. Oh, bullshit. <laughs> you do not do 20 sets to failure in a workout because it cannot physically be done. Mm -hmm. And I guess uh, something else that uh, has been hugely overlooked. Um, again, I made another graphic on this because I, yeah. I do try. I do try to help uh, yeah. simplify these concepts. Oh and no, I, and I know, and, and that's yeah. a difficult thing. And there's obviously Agreed. a lot of nuance that gets left out of uh, you know yeah. all these uh, even articles. It's like you know sometimes you oh, can't, Absolutely. can't explore everything. Um, but what what I think people often forget is the difference between the effect size of the stimulus per repetition across varying level of advancements. So what I mean is, uh, yeah. you know, a novice will get greater stimulus per rep, uh, pretty much irrespective of how close they are to failure when compared to someone yeah. who's advanced, who's going to get basically nothing until those final uh, few reps. And that yeah. has huge implications in terms of how we then uh, structure program design. And there's additional considerations around, you know, um, advanced lifters because they have greater potential to recruit motor units. Yeah. Uh, they also induce more fatigue because they're lifting greater absolute loads, all these sorts of things. So I'd be curious Absolutely. to hear your thoughts on, um, you know, how the effective reps uh, concept sort of plays into this, because I think when you add this into uh, the works, it sort of dilutes, um, you know, the, the simplicity of, Oh, it's just a final five reps. Um, you know, yeah. so, so be um, to hear your thoughts, Lars. One, before you, I'll come back to that. There was one thought I had on a previous topic that I think Good. is worth addressing. And, and maybe in my thoughts on this too is, because this question comes up all the time, how many straight sets does something like a mile rep or a dog crap rest pause set equate to? Mm. Right? So let's say you do a mile rep set, you do your activation set, you get however many more rep, like you might get, what, eight or 10 effective, like how many straight sets at say two reps in reserve, is that the equivalent of? Yeah, I, I would say that it hugely depends on like how effective somebody is at pushing to true failure under this fatigue. Is true too. Because, because uh, there is like volitional failure is, oh, sure. is a huge factor in, in a my rep set. Like most people don't actually get to true failure like it just hurts point. and they stop <laughs> sure because um, so. I, I think blade i think blade has said that one my one proper maya rep set maybe we should mm. define that is worth about three to four straight sets at an appropriate intensity and i think i i had originally kind of guessed it too but you know this goes to the, what you're talking about with intensity and volume i bet if you kind of guesstimated the number of effective reps in total mm. it's probably pretty damn close to that Mm -hmm. Right. So if you do a set of eight to not quite failure, you're going to get whatever two effective reps and then you do three more and that's five and two more is seven and one more there's eight. And mm -hmm. if you were to do, you know, two straight sets at two RIR, you're probably getting two to three a piece. And I, I bet it's right. I bet it's in that range. It wouldn't um, be far off. I, I would say like yeah. I use, I use my reps for, um, a lot of my isolation exercises for the yeah. better part of like 12 months. Um, yeah. and like I, I made some pretty good progress and, and I guess like by progress, I mean my activation set, like my performance was going yeah. up, um, over time. And, and that's the proxy uh, that you should yeah. be using, not just like how many yes. effective reps, but is performance 
um, yeah. you know, over, over the months and years in those activation sets increasing. Um, because then that sort of takes care of all the uh, yeah, of my rep sets. Um, yeah. And it's super time efficient. So, yes. you know, I think it lends itself really well to single joint movements. And yes. I think, you know, for people who actually have the, the ticker and the, you know, the balls essentially to, sure. uh, to endure the pain and like really push, um, then it, it's a really viable strategy. And yeah, agreed. I think it's pretty equivalent um, from, from what I've seen um, yeah. anyway in practice. But it saves a bunch of time. And like if you're getting... Oh, yeah. If you're like late, late intermediate, early advanced and advanced and you've got to spend, you know, like half an hour, 40 minutes warming up to your, your working <laughs> right, 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 right. Like, yeah, it takes me like I'm squatting. I don't know what it is in pounds, but like 200, 210 kilos um, yeah, for sets of six. Yeah. Um, you know, and that takes me a good 30 minutes to get to that. And then 30 minutes sure. to finish the sets. Yeah. It's an hour and I've done fucking four sets. Like that's a pain yeah. in the ass. Um, yeah, agree. Yeah, agreed. Uh, and, absolutely and if i can add leg extensions in you know after that and i do you know my rep uh, my rep sets and i've got one activation plus four to five my rep sets after that it's like i can get that in yeah. in like five minutes um yeah and, and no absolutely super, and that's super handy um but yeah i think it's a i think they'd be pretty equivalent from what i've seen anyway yeah, I, like this is all, you know, kind of rough estimations anyway. But yeah. yeah, but like I said, if, I bet if you were to compare all of the, you know, the systems that have been shown over the years to be effective, whether it's, you know, hypertrophy specific training, dog crap, my reps, it, it all kind of washes out in the big picture. It's all pretty much about the same, um, especially if you're looking at naturals. Like as soon as you add other factors, a lot of this stuff gets really, really skewed because just about anything works and a lot, a lot of goofy stuff works. So going back to the, the, the next year, your, your, the previous question, which was, how does this change as you get more advanced? And this actually reminds me of an article series. I bet I'm one of about four people that have even seen, right? You know, who Scott Abel is. Mm -hmm. Right. Contest prep guy out of Canada. He, he was big years and years and years ago. And he wrote this two part series for an old magazine called Peak Training Journal. And this is early 2000s. As most people listening to this were, were probably still hadn't even weren't even in high school yet. And he had this idea called innervation training. And it was very neurologically based. It was very much, you know, very similar to a lot of what we're talking about, generating tension in the target muscles, that exercise selection was more than just compounds are good in terms of if you're rowing and your biceps are dominant neurologically, you may, et cetera, et cetera. But one of the points he made was he, he divided his training into sort of two segments. And as a beginner and intermediate, it was volume approach. And as you got to a higher level, it became more of an intensity approach. And the analogy he used was, Yes, Dorian Yates may only be well. May only need one truly intense set, but he's been training for years. And if you watch the intensity in blood and guts, most people can't do that. And he said the difference is he has a hammer, and beginners are trying to do it with like a foam mallet because yeah. beginners don't have the capacity, either in a technical, a focus, neurological, or whatever standpoint. They need that volume to build that capacity to get to that intensity. And I think that's kind of what you're getting at. We know that beginners will get gains from like 60% of max. Like whether they do 60% or 90%, it's all the same. Uh, in the, so basically, a lot of that's neurological. It may just be that, you know, they're getting as many effective reps as they can at that level. Intermediates, 80%, right? We've got all the RIA meta-analyses and some of those. that are a little more strength-oriented, but practically we know that you need to work moderately heavier. And then as you get to a much more advanced level, you may need to go, you know, 80, 85% range more, again, more for strength gains, mm -hmm. but you are getting better at focus, technique, you know, whatever, mind muscle length, being able to use the muscles actually in the exercises, um, whether or not you're getting actual increased motor unit recruitment, debatable, most people can get pretty full recruitment, at least in certain activities. Um, so yeah, I think as probably as you get to a higher intensity, you are looking at needing to get, well, potentially needing more effective reps as a stimulus, right? I think this is where a lot of the argument going on right now sort of comes is, you know, does volume need to keep coming up as you go? Like I would offer a contrarian and an unpopular opinion that as people get to a higher level of training, volume may need to come down. 
for exactly the reasons that you state. They're using heavier loads, right? The guy squatting 900, which I know that's really applicable to most of us listening to this, <laughs> but the guy who can squat in that level cannot possibly handle the amount of volume as someone squatting half of that. And even if they're at the same percentage of maximum, the 400 is simply less of an overall stress. You know, and I think if you look at like Charlie Francis, like as his sprinters hit higher and higher and higher levels, every time they'd hit a PR, their speeds were so much higher that even though 100% is 100%, as they learned to reach a higher 100%, that makes any sense, mm -hmm. it was more of a stress to the body. So I would almost contend that as you reach higher levels, you probably need less volume and more relative intensity. Yes. And I know that's an unpopular opinion in the modern world. You know, and a lot of that, oh, the Russians, more volume, 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 volume. Yeah, we know what else was going up, the drug volume. Yeah. That's and I, the think, other I think that's what um, many people often forget is that your training is only as effective as your ability to recover from it. And yeah. if you're jacking up volume as an advanced lifter and assuming that you're maintaining or increasing relative intensity, um, right. like where are you going to get these additional recovery, you know, resources yeah. from, um, sure. you know, they don't just grow out of thin air unless you're uh, on the Mexican supplements. Yeah, um, right. And I think people also forget that there's a number of systems that are, you know, stressed and the body doesn't differentiate stress. Um, <laughs> you know, people, people take a very myopic view. It's, uh, you know, building muscle and they look simply at the, uh, you know, individual components of a muscle and that's all that matters it's like there this is a component within a, a much bigger you know structure and system here and that's um, more complex than people realize there's a very 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 old saying from the 80s or 90s about that that is every day is kidney day and the the point kind of being that training yes is local but is also systemic mm -hmm. and you know we know that like that was fred hadfield years ago said oh there's no such thing as uh so there's no such thing as central over. It's all local. But as long as you rotated muscle groups properly, you would never overtrain. And that is just bullshit. It doesn't work that way because every day is you're stressing the endocrine system, the neurological system, the central governor system. People forget about connective tissue, all the, and which tend to be connective tissue, especially like that's a whole separate thing. That is the forgotten factor in training. Huge that is huge for a lot of people. What's that? It's a, it's a bottleneck for a lot of people. And that's usually what gives out. Like all these high frequency systems that are becoming very popular, like, yeah, they're great until you get tendonitis. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, you, you will hear that from steroid users. They get so strong so fast and they can bump their volume up and they're going heavier with higher volume and then they end up with elbow tendonitis. That and, and connective tissue, tissue just takes absolutely forever to adapt. So, so yeah, you've got those systemic factors as well. And I think as you get to higher levels, fatigue management becomes an enormously higher, higher issue. And so we're left with that compromise. How do we do enough effective training per unit, whether it's per workout or per week, and survive it? And the way I typically approached it, right, the way I sort of approach a career of training, you know, beginners need to learn how to lift. As you reach, before they learn how to train, right, they need proper technique, lifting, learn how to focus and push and stuff, zero to six months, whatever. Then they get to where they're learning to push a little bit harder, right? You can go full body for that first six months, even a year. Once you get into an intermediate level, I typically go, you know, upper, upper, I like upper level split because it keeps your shoulders from falling off. There are others that work. Um, a lot of people don't like working all the whole upper body at once. Um, you know, cycling every eight to 12 weeks, ramp up, hit a new peak, come back down, fatigue, you know, and then as you get to more advanced, I personally like to use specialization programs mm -hmm. just because you get to a point where you cannot bring up everything at once. People want to and they try, but let's say you do need relatively slightly higher volume and slightly higher intensity. You cannot do that for every muscle group, not when you're at that level of performance. Um, I've even heard of power lifters getting better results, right? Because again, think of an elite power lifter who's squatting, let's say, seven, benching in the fours, deadlifting in the six to sevens. Can you really put enough energy into all three of those at once to bring them all up at the same time? Not, not, not likely. Some guys probably can, but the majority of people, again, without being supported. And I think that's why you see a lot of people uh, like elite powerlifters 
um, you know, let's say they hurt their lower back and they stop squatting and deadlifting yeah. and they do a bench only meet and their bench, they just hit a, you know, r- massive yeah. bench PR. It's like, well, you've just got more adaptive currency to yeah. go towards, you know, um, uh, your bench. And I think that's a, gr- a great sort of, um, you know, inference that specializing yeah. in, a, in a particular lift muscle group um, as you get more advanced is probably and, a really good idea. And what, and what I've heard of some powerlifters doing is they will just do rotational cycles. They'll basically mm. maintain, you know, now squat and deadlift overlap more. Building your squat tends to build the deadlift mm. if you're doing enough back work to a degree anyway. You've got to practice your deadlift some. But it's like, so they'll do a cycle and they'll just maintain one or two lifts and they'll just focus and they'll bring that one up and then they'll maintain. And I think it's the same thing for, for hypertrophy. I typically, you know, pick one, either one upper and one lower muscle group or one larger and one smaller muscle group and just pound the sh- shit out of it for four to six weeks. Like maintain everything else, cut your volume, maintain intensity. You know, I'd use this, whatever the standard two third volume cut. If you hit three or four heavy sets, you'll maintain just fine over a six week span. People lose their minds that they're going to lose up. Now nah, you'll, you'll be fine. Pound those, like you said, put that adaptive currency in those two muscles so you can do the volume and the intensity. And then, rotate Mm -hmm. and i what's always interesting to me and i don't know why this is when people move out of maintenance or sorry move out of specialization and drop the volume on those body parts they tend to keep growing for a little while Mm. and i don't know if it's you know long-term delayed growth effect a la uh (laughs) sifin berkashansky or if it's just glycogen in water i I don't know but there is the first one or two weeks they tend to even see see, you know because it's just it acts as a taper as you bring up the other muscle groups. So I, I tend to approach it that way. Um, I don't know, you know, just cause there's just a limit. Um, especially, you know, if you want to use a volume approach, especially you can't right. do high volume for eight muscle groups. You mm. just can't do it in a week. Um, yeah, I, th- I think pragmatic considerations uh, in the evidence-based community are hugely overlooked um, because a lot of these yeah. people don't work with folk who are actually, um, you know, like, ordinary people working a nine sure. to five with, you know, uh, you know, kids, family, all these kind of things. Um, and I guess that's where my position is a little unique. You know, I work in the flesh yeah. with, you know, hundreds of people and I see that, you know, it's shit 45 minutes. They got to, you know, start wrapping things up in the gym and, yeah. um, you know, on paper, it's like, great, we can have, you know, all of this set volume and things like that, sure. but you got to figure out how you can get that in. Um, I mean, there, you know, there's also the issue. They're probably not aiming for no. the lead lead anyway. 30. Totally. And when you want to reach the higher levels, there is going to be, you know, you're going to have to, to pay some dues to some degree. But even there, there's a limit, you know, unless you're independently wealthy and don't have to work and have no other stresses in your life to, to try to throw that much volume and intensity. We sort of got, you know, into everything at once. I just don't think it works very well. Mm-hmm. I think people just, especially when you're looking at the overall rate of growth at the elite, you know, the, the, the advanced level anyway, if like, mm-hmm. if you're getting half a pound a month, you're doing pretty well, you might as well at least put that into to one or you're also, if you're in a bodybuilding context, probably at the point where you've got specific weak points, mm-hmm. right? If you are a competitive physique athlete, you know, as opposed to, you know, uh, being involved in an actual sport, um, ha ha, that'll get me some hate mail. Um, you know, you're dealing with, okay, I have a weak point on stage muscularly that I need to bring up. Well, put your focus there. You know, as a power lifter, you may have weak points that you need to bring up or as a performance athlete, um, but you need to focus on that for however long of a period of time, bring it up and then address the next weakness. Um, but this, this is all kind of sort of tangential to your original question, which I think was at the advanced level, are we getting a greater stimulus a greater effective stimulus at that effective rep range, or are we getting less of one because of take your pick just because you're more advanced, repeated bout effect, whatever. Like what, what, like yeah. ending, feedback loops, whatever the hell. Sure. Is, you, you know, cause like we know when they've done those studies on you know, the duration of protein yeah. synthesis, it's shorter at the advanced level, right? We know that whatever it's 36 hours at a beginner to intermediate level. And then it basically dies off a hell of a lot sooner. Um, I don't think that's been systematically tested across, you know, different volumes and intensities, but clearly the adaptation gets more and more blunted, the more and more events you get. That's why it gets harder. It's one of the reasons it gets harder and harder and harder to grow. Um, so do you need more volume? Do you need more relative intensity? Do you need more frequency, which I know is being thrown out there as, as the next training variable to sort of manipulate, um, 
And I don't know that there's necessarily, you know, a discrete answer at this point. Mm -hmm. um, I think something else that might be worth addressing briefly, right? So we've been in this mindset that only those maximal activation reps are the maximal hypertrophic reps. Well, that's true if you're talking about the highest threshold motor units. What about the other ones? Mm. Right? If you go to eight reps on a 12 RM, right? A 12 rep max, you stop at eight. It's not like you went from no activation to all activation at rep A. Mm -hmm. you, you activated type one fibers, some type two fibers. You didn't activate all of them. Are those not getting a growth stimulus of some sort? Maybe not the type one, that's a durational thing, but there, there's going to be an intermediate uh, population of type two fibers that probably were activated across four or five reps. Mm -hmm. they, so, so it's not like, and I think that's another thing you brought up early. A set is not, unless it's truly a warm up set, it's not like it's either effective or it's not. Right, that's the, that's the HIT fallacy. If you don't go to failure, you don't know if the set was worked. Well, no. We've got reps in reserve, we've got reps to failure, we've got RPE. It takes some practice to use them, but we have those things. And if you are experienced with them, you do know how hard you're working, relatively speaking. So I do think even those sets that aren't to true limits or to that range are going to be effective for some population of fibers. It may not get all of them. Mm -hmm. And let's, let's just bring that back to the discussion of level of advancement. So yeah. um, I, guess, I guess something that would be really valuable to the listeners is just uh, some basic uh, guidelines in terms of relative intensity as it relates to this effective reps concept for you know, beginners, intermediates, advanced. So um, I'll spitball some numbers and you can sort of uh, yeah. chime in, tell me whether you agree, disagree. So I would say for beginners, anywhere from like zero to six or seven, because again, they're getting higher stimulus per rep. They need to work on yeah. technique. They need to, you know, make sure that they're not having technical breakdown during their set and any level yeah. of fatigue can generally cause that. Intermediates, that's where it's basically a situation of learn how to train hard. Now you've learned how to yeah. lift, learn how to train hard. Average relative intensities of anywhere from, you know, six to nine-ish. And then for advanced lifters, I think that's where they need basically from five to 10 because they just can't train at those really high relative intensities all the time. Yeah. Uh, so they need to, you know, balance that out with, you know, some undulating periodization strategy where it's like, you know, they'll squat hard uh, one yeah. day, then they'll deadlift, uh, you know, hard the next day with light squats or something along those lines. Yes. Um, there's just that undulation so that they can get some stimulus, um, but they won't be able to train at high relative intensities all the time. It's much more of a balancing act with fatigue and sustainability. Yeah. So, I guess work from there, bottom up, yeah. beginners work through. I mean, yeah, like I said, beginners, you can be at 60% of max, which is like, you know, what? It'd be 20 if you took them to limits, which you wouldn't do. Yeah, and sets of 10, most of those gains are neurological. There is some growth occurring, but, you know, you're getting recruitment, you're getting some growth. If you go too heavy too soon, their technique breaks down, they get, you know, you got to give connective tissues time to adapt, et cetera, et cetera. So with beginners, I almost don't care. Right. I'm, I'm so non-concerned with, with that, you know, we might, there is one odd little study I, I, that I, I reported, cited to a couple of years ago and I couldn't come up with it right now. And it looked at growth for a complex versus a simple exercise. I think it was in beginner women. So it was like squats or leg extensions. It was something or it was like bench press or chest press or something like that. And what it found was that the simpler exercise, you got growth sooner. And then it slowed down and with the complex exercise, it took longer and then picked up. And I think that's just real easy. I could, if I wanted to, I could take a beginner. I could put them on a chest press machine today and I could just rep them out till they stopped. They would not be able to move their arms for a week and I would never do that, but I could. Mm -hmm. Whereas if I had been doing a dumbbell bench press, their technique is going to, it's going to take me weeks to get them stable enough for a barbell bench press. You know, squat, I could put them on a leg press and just destroy them on day one. So there is that issue. Conceivably, you could work at a higher relative intensity for a beginner if you pick nothing but simple movements. I personally wouldn't because I don't think it, it accomplishes much. But if, you know, coaches listening to this, if you've got a young guy and you're going to lose him, if he doesn't start growing sooner rather than later, teach him how to squat and bench press and then take him to the machines and just torch him, right? Because that way he'll start seeing – because the simple stuff, you can get it done. 
because you're not limited by all these other variables. So I agree with you completely with beginners. Intermediate, you need to start pushing a little bit harder. You know, what I always did with my clients is like, all right, you think you're done. Give me two more. And they get two more and they'd be like, oh, I had two more. And a couple workouts later and gradually they realize that their limits are a lot further than they think they are. And I think as you reach that intermediate level, which realize that's where most of this research is done. If you look at the training status of the people, you know, look at their mid-thigh isometric pull, for example, like that peak force, I think it's a really good, good metric in the gym. Um, you're probably going to need to be, I think anything less, you know, four, four reps in reserve is probably pushing it. Five, if you do enough sets, maybe. But again, they're still learning how to push and how to train. Right? They've learned how to lift, now they need to learn how to train. Once you get to that year, year and a half mark, I don't personally see a lot of purpose, maybe at the very beginning of a progressive cycle, going much lower than three reps in reserve. I just don't see it as being predictably, I think if you look at most people in the gym, that's they're doing that or more and just not really getting anything out of it. The training is just a lot, but it's not accomplishing much. Um, sort of in that random vein, someone posted up a thesis in my group. You might have seen it. And it, it was comparing machines and free weights for growth. And they did like machine squats, Smith squat, bench press, machine bench press, two different groups. And they gave them their workouts, but they didn't supervise them. And they found that there was no difference in growth over eight weeks between machines and free weights. But here's why. Nobody grew, right? The, the changes, the increase in muscle thickness was like 0.2 millimeters even the worst studies that have been done get like two millimeters on the, tri on the, the biceps and the triceps. And this is what happens when you don't supervise people. They go piss around, right? Studies have shown that left self-selected training intensities are like 60% of max. And it's like 65 if they've worked with a trainer, right? So most people in the gym, they are intermediates and above. They're just pissing around. And that's why they're not getting anywhere. So I think intermediate, you're probably looking at two to three RIR, most, you know, on average, and you might push that over a cycle and get to limits and test yourself, and then you need to back off and do it again. That's, you know, you get into some basic eight-week cycles. My generic bulking routine, I think Blade does that, where he starts a little bit lighter and progress up. Hypertrophy-specific training, you started at 12s and went 10, 8, 5 negatives, and you tried to hit a new peak, and then you backed off. Uh, dog crap had cruises and blasts. Like, the patterns... We all end up each reaching kind of the same place yeah. by different pathways, but if you ignore the details, the generalities are all the same. And then when you get to that advanced level, and this reminds me of a story on my old forum, this guy is very advanced. It's a guy I told him, dude, you're as big as you're going to get. He's like 195 in shape as a natural. Good dude, you can go crush any natural contest you have. And he said, I want to use your intermediate bulking routine, which is two heavy days upper and lower twice a week. And I said, don't do it. You're too advanced. You're too strong. It'll break you. And eight weeks later, he said, your workout sucks because now my joints hurt. And I said, what did I tell you? Right? What did I tell you? And I think even past, even at the advanced intermediate, if you're getting very strong, two heavy days a week is probably going to break you. Yeah. Right? That's where something like, perhaps, you know, Lane Norton's, what is it, fat? I don't even know what it stands for. Power hypertrophy something training where you have a heavy day where you do your heavy five to eights and then you do your lighter, you know, uh, my generic bulking routine does the heavy work and the pump work in the same workout. You do your heavy sets of five to eight, you do your sets 12 to 15. If you want to crank out a couple 20 rep, whatever, go home, but you do that twice a week. That becomes untenable as you get very strong. Mm -hmm. Then you do your two heavy days and then you do your two lights. So you do all the heavy work on one day and then you do your pump work on another. That's how powerlifters have traditionally trained, heavy light. Got a heavy squat day, light squat day, heavy bench day, light bench day, and then you got to try to figure out where the hell deadlifts go <laughs> because they're, they work such of every, like deadlifts have always been a programming problem because of how they overlap. But yeah, like usually it's heavy squat, light deadlift, lighter squat, heavy deadlift, Matt Gary, USAPL, National team coach does it that way. Bench, bench people go a little bit heavier a little bit more often just because the weights aren't as ponderous. But if you're a dude, I guarantee these guys benching 700, or whatever, 600, they're not doing that twice a week. 
Um, you look at West Side, they had the ME day where they went to 100%. And they did the dynamic effort day at 60% change. They're like the patterns keep showing up. And at the advanced level, mm. you might do one day that is one or two reps in reserve, really push hard, and then do another day where you're at three to four, keep a little bit lighter, or use a higher repetition range. And I think that um, also ties into you know basic concepts related to periodization. Um, yeah. which are more necess- more of a necessity as you're advanced. Like you need periods with greater specificity yes. um, and reductions in variations, you know, periodically to facilitate like a more concentrated focus on a narrow band of adaptive targets. So you can induce, you know, rapid development of those prioritized right. attributes. I think, you know, as an advanced lifter, um, you know, you just can't train, train generally hard all the time. It's like you need to have yeah. you know, very specific windows where you train hard and then pull back. Um, and, and, I, and I think that's where sports training in general and bodybuilding have diverged the most. Mm. Sports training, regardless of the scheme they follow, has, has been about periodization for decades. And bodybuilders, by and large, have just been about go hard all the time. Mm-hmm. And a, you can't, if you do truly go hard all the time, you eventually break down. I think the reason most guys do it is what they're going hard all the time is, is really just kind of pissing about, yeah. right? If you actually really hammered them for four to six weeks, and, and the two Barbalo who studied, Barbalo studied, especially the one in women, I think really pointed that out. Those strength gains in those women were abs- they made 50% improvement in six months, right? They went from beginner bench to intermediate bench three years to beginner bench and then six months to intermediate bench because I genuinely believe that was the first time they had been pushed that hard. And you see this in these studies where people are supervised for the first time and are truly getting pushed the gains they make. But if they do that for long periods of time, you eventually burn out and bodybuilders, even when Brian Haycock was proposing hypertrophy specific training, I said, look, this system looks great on paper. I think it's brilliant physiologically. Nobody's going to listen. He goes, what do you mean? I go, Bodybuilders are not going to train submaximally five out of six workouts a week or five out of six workouts every two weeks. They won't do it psychologically because it doesn't fulfill their needs. And he goes, I think you're wrong. And uh, I wasn't wrong. Like a small group adopted it. But at the time, nobody was ready. And I think bodybuilders by and large still aren't ready to hear that of doing any sort of intensity cycle. Whether it's spending, you know, and we could have another podcast, different, you know, you, again, you go back into the history of it, and they were like, oh, you need to do this for mitochondria and capillaries, because that can be limiting. You do this for the myofibrin, you do this for the nervous system, and you can look at, I wrote a periodization for bodybuilding thing, like maybe we do three to four weeks of truly pump work, right? Gives the joints a break, connective tissue has a chance to heal up, maybe it brings up mitochondria, which is a limiting, maybe it brings up capillaries, maybe it brings up sarcoplasm, whatever it is. Then you're prepped to, and you might do a little bit of heavy work then, a couple heavy sets, and then go get your volume work or lighter, BFR, low load, even 15s. Then you hammer yourself for four to six, maybe eight weeks in that five to eight rep range. You might still be doing heavy and light. You finish with two or three weeks of really heavy neural training to bump up your max strength. Take an easy week. Start over again. Bodybuilders just don't do this sort of thing. They train at the same intensity kind of year round. I like uh, it. I like and so, yeah, it. so I, th- and I think that's a way of incorporating kind of everything we've talked about mm. is acknowledging that there are, that you can get to effective reps and there's multiple paths to it. Yeah. You can get two heavy sets of failure and you get, you get brain and like you get mentally exhausted as mm-hmm. much as physically. And I know there's not really much, there's not really much of a difference in the big picture, but you just wear out and your joints hurt all the time. And that's not really conducive to good training in my experience. So yeah, so fine. Spend two or three weeks, train at a three to four RIR, but do more sets. Mm -hmm. It will build your work capacity, might improve your ability to recover. Maybe, you know, that was always GPP is not sexy. Work capacity training is not sexy, but it can be beneficial long-term. Then spend four to six weeks just blowing your brains out. You might cut your cut your volume, start pushing at one to two RIR, start pushing, do my rep to failure, do a mix. Mm. And like for, for power lifters, absolutely. You do not want to be grinding squats to failure. Five sets of three out of five RM or six set is way superior to three sets of five from a quality rep standpoint. Once you've been in the gym for an hour and a half warming up, 
and doing your work sets, right, of your squats and your good mornings, and now you've been, you got 30 minutes left, just go do whatever. Go do two Maya rep sets for leg extensions and leg curls and abs and just get that shit out of the way without burning yourself out. So cut your volume, really work hard, maybe do a short little neural phase. I do think those are important for bodybuilders in the long term, bump up maximal strength levels, lets you handle heavier weights at moderate, take a real light week, go dick around in the gym for a week, and then start over again. And, and that way you're getting all of these different variables or different ways of getting to that goal. You may be getting different fiber types, you may be getting different limiting factors in the system. And I think that would probably be a much better big picture, you know. Um, Definitely. And undulating does that within a week. But I think people, undulating I think works better at the intermediate level. Mm. For a number of reasons. One is it tends to be full body and there's only so much you can do full body when you're advanced. Like that's why my full body work, that's an intermediate program because when you're advanced, you cannot train your entire upper body. Either you go up or lower. Train your entire upper body that heavily, it just can't be done. Something suffers. Your first couple of exercises will be great and the rest of your workout will be piled. Um, and the daily undulating periodization always had the problem that every day was to limits, right? It was like, oh, 8 RM Monday and 15 RM Wednesday and 3 RM Friday and people got fried. So do it, take that block training approach, do it in a bigger picture kind of way. Do your 15s for three or four weeks and then do heavy five to eights for six to eight weeks or whatever numbers work out. And then do three to fives or power, a little bit of power bodybuilding, which I think is another way to get to the same place, you know, do your heavy fives and then follow it up with some lighter work. And I think that pretty much you're going to, that works and, and puts all this together. What you can't do is either just do a ton of volume at too little intensity or do high volume with super high intensity because it, it, A, it can't be done, and B, it doesn't work, even if it can. Yeah, definitely. Well, Lyle, I think we covered a lot of ground there. Thank you so okay. much for coming Absolutely. back on. And guys, uh, be sure to check out Lyle's website, bodyrecomposition.com. And he's, yeah really active on there at the moment. And if you're yeah. lucky enough to get in the Facebook group also, yeah. Um, yeah, check that out. Thank you, Lyle. Very good. Thanks, Jacob.